Good Thursday morning. And welcome to Ice Age TV, the internal combustion engine YouTube channel that talks about the cars and the trucks and the motorcycles and the adventures and the trailers. And wow. And everybody, appreciate anybody watching my channel, tuning in. If I'm sound groggy this morning, I am. I haven't had a cup of coffee. Uh, I didn't even get to sleep till 1 a.m. I didn't sleep much at all because when you travel, what I've noticed when I drive all day long and do a lot of things, I'm just so revved up. I can't go to sleep. <laughs> I just can't go to sleep. So I just barely slept last night. Even slept in a little later than I thought I would. So, wow, I need my cup of coffee. Kind of dragging here. And <clears throat> my gosh, boy, <laughs> here it is in Tennessee. How the weather from Tennessee to Virginia is so different. I mean, I'm up north there, and uh, it's cooler. It rains a lot down here, and wow, I mean, it's just, it really is a contrast. You would kind of think that this being the southern area, that more in the south, this would be a more, it would be a hotter area, but it's not. And these Smoky Mountains really do create, it seems, the rains, creates more of a cooler environment. And up north, I mean, it just is, it was hot when I left for the most part, and no rain. We haven't had rain here for a while. There's no rain in the distant future, and so just wow. And uh, I'm getting my coffee going here. It's interesting. My mother-in-law's cats are kind of getting used to me. <clears throat> it's taking them a few years to get used to me. Her cats are very isolated, independent. So uh, wow, what a drive. And you'll be the first one with me in daylight to see the accident that I was involved in last night with my truck. And thank God, nothing radical happened and everybody's okay. But here it is. Here is the, uh, I think, the 300 plus pound deer. I don't even know the size of the deer as far as the weights. But it was a full-size deer. It was big, and I hit that deer at 70 miles an hour. Pretty incredible that this bumper just totally saved this grill. I'm amazed. But this truck sits up pretty high, so the whole front bumper has been damaged. I don't think the, you know, the rails, those are okay. So it's more about a new bumper. So I don't think it's too bad. Little, so, you know, looks like got some cosmetic things there in the lower part of the bumper. Wow, that was the first hit for me in many years on hitting a uh, a deer. I mean, I've hit deer before, but nothing at highway speeds. I was coming down 81, just outside of Withville, Virginia. This came off, and all of a sudden, you know, it's it's, it's dark for the most part, getting dark. And all of a sudden, here's a deer standing in front of me. And the deer literally was, you know, sideways, totally, you know, like parallel to the truck, the whole body. And so when I hit that deer, it was sideways when I hit it. And then I felt the thing go up underneath the truck. And so my daughter was behind me in the Dodge Challenger, which, thank goodness, I was a lead person because you just saw the damage to the front of that truck. And you can only imagine in the car, we all know, car, that deer most likely would have you know, gotten hit and then hit the windshield. The car would borderline be parked and not drivable. Airbags would have deployed. And that's something about that truck is no airbags deployed. I mean, thank goodness that's such a big truck. But the whole point is, oh, you can see back here, I just saw this because I haven't looked at anything. Here's the blood. So that that deer then got wrapped up underneath this hitch. Oh, look at this here. Oh, wow. So here's the back of the truck all splattered with uh, blood. Wow. <laughs> and then my daughter was behind me, even got up in there, the crime scene, right? Probably up underneath there is probably a bunch of blood. Then I went underneath the trailer, and so my daughter claims that, so my daughter, thank goodness she was able to slow down, that the deer then came out underneath the trailer, and it flipped it over into the right-hand lane, and it landed in the right-hand lane. Now, for my daughter, thank God she's got a performance car, 
Because she claims that when she saw me break, well, I've, bore, I've been run, no, didn't lock up the truck, but I did hard break. But you're not going to stop <laughs> when that thing's right in front of you. But she did hard braking. She claimed she about came to a stop. And that's why she was able to escape from that deer having anything to do with her. So in that situation there, having that Dodge Challenger scat pack, which is upstairs here, another part of the driveway, that was a blessing because that car has such incredible braking power so that she wasn't involved in that deer i mean so she claims that she was down to 10 miles an hour very quickly i was like wow so i'm probably gonna sneeze so excuse me if i do but the uh maybe maybe not you ever had that thing you're gonna sneeze and you don't i gotta get my coffee so wow <laughs> what a trip overall good trip the furniture that i loaded up in that wasn't uh it, it seems to stay and I didn't break anything. Yeah, it's famous last words as I see how I tied it down, broke the leg, right? Oh my gosh, here's the, the red eye. I forgot to get the tag for this damn thing. Sales guy called me the other day and I'm like, hey, where's the. Uh... He's like, you got your tag. And I thought you buy a dealership with the damn tag for this thing. I didn't even know that story. All about the adventures of me buying that car back. And uh, I need some ice to. Put on my coffee. This is just too uh, too hot. If you know what I mean. So yeah. So the conversation this morning, I was more focused on talking about the Chinese and the electric vehicles and where that came from. And you know what I did? I brought down my uh, other tripod, and I think I'll probably do that. And so in my office here. Come to my office and yeah, here's it's part of the kitty cat room. Yeah, this is my office. My mother in law turned it into the kitty cat room. So yikes. Yeah, so I got my TV, got my heater, and got my other goodies and got my tripod here. So yeah, see this just radiates upstairs. So if I sit in here and talk in here, it's gonna be way too much noise. Oh, mother-in-law, if you know what I mean. And I've got limited time with my kid standing in front of me. And she'll be hungry. Let's see how this works. I'll be amazed. I'll probably turn off the freaking video. Trying to do it, you know what I mean? So now you guys can have the the look of uh, me. Yeah, why did you try us earlier? Why did you set this thing up earlier? It's like, yeah, my freaking schedule. It just doesn't end. I'll have to set it on my truck back here or something. But I gotta get coffee, man. I mean, Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was nerve wracking. Once you kind of have that experience of hitting something, I mean, that thud, I mean, that was just a total, like, you know, bam. And to hear that thing go underneath the truck and everything. Can I do this thing right? Can I get her? How's that? Or anybody else here watching my channel? So I was kind of wanting to get the background so you could see the uh, beautiful scenery here. Can I do that without my phone falling out? Probably not. Eh, who knows. Oh, well. I was going to get you this, the, the scenic mountain look, but so I stand way back here. Probably can't hear me as well, so uh, we'll keep on playing with a little bit. But anyway, so the, this morning's conversation was really going to be about the electric China Revolution. And how about that? A little better? And so, yeah, that was going to be the conversation. Now I thought to myself, why don't we make it about accidents? Yeah, I mean, why don't we make the conversation, got to get this thing tilted up just a little bit more, about uh, deer accidents. So this morning I did some research, and wow, this isn't comforting. You know, I ride motorcycles, and I know some people that have been critically injured from hitting deer on their motorcycle. Once you hit that, like last night, when I hit that deer in that motor, in that big ass truck, and I felt that impact, I'm thinking, oh my God, if you're on a motorcycle, you're dead. If you're on highway speeds on a motorcycle and you hit a deer that big, I don't see how you'd live. I mean, that was a huge bam in that truck. 
so this morning I woke up and I did some research and it says one, it's one chance out of 116 people, you will hit a deer. Wow. Uh, anywhere from 1.6 to 2.1 million deer are hit annually in this country. Wow. Uh, Six million are killed by uh, the hunters. Um, 150 to 200 people die annually from hitting deer. Uh, 10,000 are injured. It's a $1 billion insurance industry uh, claims. Wow. West Virginia is one of the worst states of you hitting deer. <laughs> and then it goes in like Montana, South Dakota. But I just think those rural areas, it's just the traffic. But but I was like, that's what, to hear the, the one chance out of 116 that you can hit a deer on your green boat. I know, I've hit some deer over the years and nothing this radical. It's been back roads when I've been going 30, 40 miles an hour and I've been able to slow down. But here's the thing, I sat and thinking to myself, boy, oh boy, that I was in left-hand lane and I was kind of coming down a grade and here's this deer just standing there. Where, and it's really weird. It was not It was just out in like the middle of really no, made no sense where this deer kind of came from on the highway. Where it's totally confused at how it got there. But I thought to myself, had I moved right hand lane and my daughter's behind my trailer and she would have stayed in the left hand lane and not maneuvered over as quickly as I did, not knowing the deer is there, would she have hit it? And wow, that would have been a whole different ball game. And so now, what I have now, now I've got another vehicle in Tennessee. <laughs> Coming down to Tennessee. Think about this. I came down to Tennessee, Port Bronco. Starts blowing oil, <laughs> right? I come down to Tennessee with the Ford F four fifty truck, and now it's a major, you know, front end a bumper. I think it's, I think it didn't get the front, uh, I guess, transmission um, cooler. You kind of looked at that video, didn't see much there in that. So, uh oh, I got a call here. Probably the kid. That'd be my guess. Yeah, here she is. So she's actually calling, but I think she kind of knows where I am now. Getting up and getting her day going as well. So I'm sure you see the dog is here before long. But anyways, so I think myself accidents. I mean, who hasn't been involved in an accident? And I've been very fortunate for being on the road, you know, since uh, 16 years old. And yeah, I've been in, I was in some horrendous car accidents. I'm lucky to be alive from back in 19, I think it was the fall of 83. I mean, I'm lucky to even be alive for how I was in a major car accident and had a major concussion and nobody even knew it. So, and I've been in other, some other accidents, but nothing radical, but it's irritating. It's nerve wracking and it does, uh, it does kind of have you step back and think about how fast these cars go. And just like I have my daughter, when she crashed that Mustang bullet in February of what, 2021 was that? And she had that impact hit of totaling that car by rear-ending another vehicle. You know, that changed her whole perspective, perspective and, and following too close to a car. I mean, that instantly got her to not follow, tailgate, understand stopping a car is a challenge once you're at certain speed. So that changed her old, you know, even to this date when she rides with me. And we come up on a car pretty quickly. She starts borderline like, stop, stop, stop. She starts freaking out. So, wow. Yikes. That's all I can say. Then my daughter puts the street bob tag on the front of that truck. And then that gets destroyed. One of my subscribers is like, you got to put that thing in a frame. You got to save that damn thing. I'm like, yikes. Yikes, man. That's scary to think about that. Yeah. What now? Yeah, good morning. Hi, how are you? Good. I don't know where the kid is. I think she's still upstairs. Really? Yeah. My YouTube channel doing my video in the morning. Yeah. You're part of the video now. All the all my subscribers will hear your voice for the first time. <laughs> so, uh, see, I, I was saying that if I get inside the house, it radiates upstairs. Well, my mother-in-law has the window open, so she turned me talk down here. So, we got in so late last night, she didn't 
she was already in bed and sleeping. So, all right. So I think I saw an accident. What's the, what? Well, how can we use that this this conversation of accidents? I think to myself. I read in uh, I read in our, an article about China's revolution of electric vehicles. I talked to myself yesterday. That's a conversation I really want to talk about because I guess in some ways. At the end of the day, can we say that's a huge accident in some aspects to what's going on in our country more than ever? Oh my gosh, it is really disturbing in so many ways of reading about how in 2009, China, in so many ways, did, or I should say, we right now, uh, in this sitting administration, the IRA, the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act, this is a copycat um, governing, you know, government policies that are borderline to the T of the China uh, governing bodies of 2009. In 2009, China began the handout government monies to entice businesses to start the electric vehicle, um, you know, process. So, if you read this article in the Wall Street Journal by this individual, it's called the Juggernaut, the China EV Juggernaut, and it talks in great length about how, in so many aspects of where we are in our country right now, we are following the Chinese governing bodies, principles, and uh, views on how the government dictates what is done more than ever in, in transportation. So, it talks in great length about how China was the first to get going, the government handing out subsidies to entice businesses to be created to make the electric vehicles and to create the electric batteries. And it talks about how now, how China is now the number one exporter of uh, vehicles over Japan. Well, I should say it's overdone Japan. And I don't know if they're the number one exporter of all the of, but the way the article says, it says it has uh, outdone Japan in export of uh, vehicles. Wow. Okay, so then it talks about the Shanghai Annual Car Show, Auto Show, Worldwide Auto Show, that the U.S. executives of the, our big you know, domestic brand and other manufacturers went to that show and they were stunned. They were like, wow, the electric car being manufactured in China has by all means met the U.S. Um, quality, if not even in some aspects better. So the executives for the big uh, automotive side and our side of the territory are seeing that it's, um, it's happening. China really is now becoming the dominant electric vehicle maker in BYD, Build Your Dream, actually outsold every uh, manufacturer in the electric vehicles segment first quarter. They sold close to 600,000 units. Tesla sold a little over 400,000 units. So they're gaining traction by leaps and bounds. And, it's, and what's going on is the Chinese are building much less expensive vehicles that the U.S. domestic side just can't see how they're going to be able to accomplish this. And then it talks about in 2019, well, hello, baby. Here's my little baby. You're smelling the dead deer. Hi there. So uh, they're talking about how Tesla, this is where, tell you, Elon Musk, it's like the love-hate for Elon Musk for me. It's like Elon Musk seems to do good things, but at the same time, man, I just think that guy, I think the long run, I just don't know if you can trust that guy because he got the rights to... Oh, here's another thing. Back in 2009, conditions for other manufacturers... Hey, baby. Morning. How you doing? Good. In 2009, conditions of China... I mean, it's just you know, the regime, the communist regime. It's a dictatorship. The, the only way you could get into China for manufacturing... The electric vehicle technology and to get the subsidies is you had to bring your technology and disclose to China what you're doing. So they had full access to your knowledge and technology, which we know China constantly wants to steal 
you know, the proprietary information that has made us above them for so many years. And so you had to, so sadly, so many foreign manufacturers, you mean Toyota and Honda and other other big manufacturers, they catered to China's rule and they disclosed on how to make these better vehicles. And even the point that was 2019, you know, Tesla, Elon Musk, you know, bragged about going to, to, uh, I guess, Shanghai or whatever Providence he went to, to, uh, become a manufacturer in China, but there was conditions. He had to disclose his, you know, proprietary Tesla technology. And so it was a huge win for the China manufacturers to have access to Tesla's technology. Wow. I mean, is anybody following along with this? So here we are at the Inflation Reduction Act where, and, and this is what it talks about in this article, is about how the government controlling more than ever manufacturing, industrialization, and how China has taken this EV business model which in most aspects, when the govern, governing bodies try to create industrialization, it creates, um, it doesn't usually have a success. It's usually a failure. It's usually an accident. And But here with China, this is a potential of maybe it does have success because they're having so much success. But China took advantage of the green agenda. That was the original conversation, 2009. China saw an opportunity to get people to buy into the green agenda and to go to the electric vehicle manufacturing. But the interesting thing is China doesn't have all the raw materials. <clears throat> it's in different other parts of the world, Australia, Congo. So for the lithium aspect, China isn't like the big miner of this uh, lithium battery technology. They're having to create relationships with other countries to have access to this. And it's the same thing here. We don't have the great access of mining this um, phosphorus, iron, nickel, the co the cobalt. There's a lot of things that this country doesn't have the infrastructure on that many analysts expect they could take years and years, up to 10 years to get a mining operation in full capacity. And it talks about how there's so much resistance of don't build this in my backyard that in this country, it's very, it can be very challenging for a lot of these companies to come here, get these subsidies to set up shop, because there's going to be so many opposers of what they're going to bring of having to use off the natural resources of the land, the water infrastructure. So, you know, a lot of analysts say, you know, this this whole idea, this whole battery and this whole battery infrastructure manufacturing is going to be much more challenging in this country than other parts of the world. And that's why I talked a few months ago, back when the big uh, miners organization got together in January this past year in Florida that key executives from big domestic and foreign automakers were buddying up with these miners and they want to get relationships with them so they can control the pricing of these raw materials to enable them to make these batteries for these EV vehicles. And but what's going on more than ever is these miners see clearly what they're trying to accomplish and a lot of them aren't just open arms. And at the same time, many of the governing bodies in these countries, like down in South America, they're changing the rules where over the next three to five years or whatever the lease deals are on land and mining, that the government's going to take control of all of this uh, these natural resources. Wow. I mean, for me, I've been saying for so long, the accident of the, the electric vehicle, the accident of the green agenda, and I haven't phrased it that way, but what I mean by that is, as time progresses, it'll take years and years for us to come to closure. Was the EV infrastructure the real answer for resolving the carbon footprint challenges of today's uh, you know world and the population of mankind and the harms that we're doing to so-called Mother Earth from this carbon footprint, ice age, technology, fossil fuel, um, energy platform and we're transforming over through more than ever a governing body and select um, agendas and well-funded agendas and, and uh, movements that and organizations that are demanding that the fossil fuels go away but in the end will we ever really know I mean will we really ever know with the population growing continuously with the mother nature earth just changing 
just because it's nature and things change. I mean, so it's going to be, so we won't know what, we'll, I don't think for me, I just don't think we'll ever know the real reality to what is accomplished through the green agenda EV model. But what's unfortunate, I think for so many that feel the same thing that I do is it's being dictated more by governing bodies and organizations that are so fixated on what they think is right versus wrong and you just can't have a conversation you just can't have a legitimate conversation of just trying to explain it the way you view things and look at things isn't really necessarily makes the sense so anyways i could talk all morning right i gotta be at breakfast we're hungry dogs are inspecting my trailer they're all smelling the deer dogs are lifting their lips yeah you found a deer in that trailer didn't you and I, part of me is like did it it's so ironic I get the 500 mile DEF range alarm come on like 30 minutes after I'd hit that deer. I'm thinking, oh gosh, did that deer go up underneath that truck and catch something and rip my DEF line off somewhere? Yeah, I mean, so I, was, I never even pulled over. <laughs> I had my daughter just pull up next to me as we're going down the highway and she's looking at the front of the truck. This is kind of dark too. And I turned the lights, headlights off and she's like, yeah, no, like it just looks like your bumper got dented in. I mean, I probably would have been wise to pull over to see if my transmission cooler had been destroyed and, and it was leaking like crazy. But I just watched all the temps and I just kept rocking and rolling. And that truck there, that freaking thing rocks. I mean, that thing rolls. And that thing, that thing will take the Ram. Hey, Ram guys, I took a bunch of Ram guys. I mean, I lied. Hey, I'm a Ram guy. But that freaking, you know, truck right there. Once you're up in that open highway, and you just want to go by a guy, and I had a guy, you know, and he wasn't even had as much wind resistance in what I had, and I still walked him, and they just hate that stuff. Don't you hate that when another guy beats you in your truck and trailer? Yeah. Are you talking about racing with your truck and trailer? Nah, we would do that, right? So, not everybody, I got projects. I got to find out my Broncos ready. I got to go to the, the Ford dealer. I got to go talk. I got to go see him in person. Because they're not calling me. I'm getting concerned now. Now i got to go find out what the insurance claim will be. But they claim that insurance companies don't frown on you because it's a huge you know, problem. It's factored probably into your rates and premiums. And so they're already expecting you to make that phone call anyways. So the good news is hopefully it's something radical. But we'll find out. So stay tuned for the adventures. And what do we do? i got to unload this trailer. got to unload the furniture. I gotta get his heavy furniture in my mother-in-law's house and set that up and get the bikes out and uh, the list goes on and on and on. But it's all good. Beautiful weather down here. And hey everybody, thanks for watching my channel. Share our channel. Stay tuned. God bless. Have a great day. And what's the next adventure, right?